Good day, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on news. What's next? I'm Douglas Barney. I'm Senior Fellow for Military Aerospace at the IISS, and I'll be the chair for today's discussion. Now, as of February the 3rd, we have at least something to consider in the context of the five-year extension to the New START Treaty. The extension, hard though it might seem, probably was the straightforward part. Whatever lies ahead will only be more challenging. But then if strategic arms control were easy, it probably wouldn't be required at all. I'm delighted to be able to introduce our two speakers today. Dr. Amy Nelson is a research fellow at the National Defence University Centre for the Study of Weapons and Mass Destruction. Her previous positions include being a Robert Bosch Fellow in Residence at the German Council in Foreign Relations in Berlin, and as a non-resident Fellow at the Stimson Centre. She also has government experience as a former policy analyst in the US Department of State's Bureau of Political and Military Affairs. Dr. Pavel Podvik is Senior Researcher in the Weapons of Mass Destruction and Other Strategic Weapons Programme at the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research. He's also a researcher with the Programme on Science and Global Security at Princeton University. Dr. Podvig also runs his own research project on Russian nuclear forces, and I might add this is a valuable resource in its own right. Finally, both Dr. Nelson and Dr. Podvig are also advisory board members on the IISS's Missile Dialogue Initiative. This is a multi-year arms control and missile technology programme supported by the German Foreign Ministry. Each of our speakers will talk for around 10 minutes or so before we go into questions and answers. Questions be can be posed in the fashion most of you will now be all too familiar with, either through raising a hand in the participants bar or in written form. Those of a preemptive nature, feel free to send in written questions during the course of our two presentations. So that's quite enough from me. Dr. Nelson, the Zoom room is all yours. Wonderful, thank you, Douglas. And thanks to you and the whole team at IISS for having me today. I'm <clears throat> delighted to be with you, uh, despite a small cold. Um, so uh, as we had discussed previously, I thought a good deal about what I could add to this ongoing conversation about New START. Uh, on one hand, as a community, we've said a good deal about New START since its negotiation and its entry into force, of course, in 2011. And additionally, additionally now, in the context of negotiations convened by the previous administration, and now with its looming expiration date and of course, extension this week. Yet on the other hand, in many ways, this is a conversation that's just beginning or beginning anew, particularly in light of, of course, the, the new US administration, but also the rapidly evolving security landscape for example, to include China's growing arsenal and new weapons and systems enabled by new technologies, including hypersonics, culminating in a renewed urgency uh, that's also imposed by withering arms control regimes writ large, which presents a real security concern today. So with that in mind, I think it's important to conceptualize New START as both first part of an arms control continuum that spans over time, and second, uh, in part by virtue of the fact that it's the only remaining bilateral treaty in force, a keystone or essential foundation or foundational component of nuclear arms control systems. And this is really what I'd like to talk about today. So first, by arms control continuum, I'm referring to the kind, the, a kind of historical approach. And to take this approach, I'll ask you all to consider the state of the world today relative to when the first nuclear arms control negotiations took place. So it, we're in the 1950s, and these are the early disarmament negotiations that were held against a security backdrop, yes, of tremendous fear, but of, an, but of a not yet fully emerged technology. Indeed, the US scientists working on the Manhattan Project and their Soviet counterparts were so daunted by the destructive power of emerging nuclear weapons technology that they were actively developing, that they were actively developing, that they found themselves at the negotiation table attempting to find ways to ban its further development, ultimately through various test bans. Now, never mind that these early attempts weren't successful. By another account, they in fact successfully laid the foundation for later test ban treaties. 
let's instead consider the proverbial chessboard. We have two nuclear powers, albeit the US with, the help from British, with help from British allies, a single major technological innovation resulting in the atom bomb and delivered with the help of gravity by a, by a bomber, and one fairly stable, we now believe, Cold War. Of course, SALT I, the first strategic arms control treaty, was finally inked in 1972, roughly 20 years later. Now, Consider today's security landscape. We have multiple latent and nuclear powers, rapidly evolving and emerging technologies, technologies that are, as uh, economist Brian Arthur points out, combinations of other technologies, giving rise to newer fields of innovation and dual use technologies and systems that include artificial intelligence, semiconductor and robotics engineering, additive manufacturing, cyber tools and capabilities, and so on and so on. And though these evolving technologies have their points of intersection with nuclear weapons and systems, exacerbating vulnerability and risk, more to the point is that there now exists multiple types of nuclear weapons and warheads, multiple types of delivery devices capable of achieving varied ranges from a variety of domains, the introduction of hypersonics to nuclear arsenals and their potential introduction to nuclear posture all of which is to say, this is indeed a complex security landscape. And as such, why would we expect a single treaty to mitigate the security concerns of all of that? It stands to reason that our arms control architecture should follow a similar trajectory and ev of evolution and augmentation of similarly increasing complexity. And this is a gradual layered and nuanced process that draws on increasingly diverse technological expertise. Arms control has indeed already evolved. For example, whereas SALT-1 relied on national technical means for verification or satellite data, the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, included the most intrusive in inspection measures included or incorporated into a treaty to date. This is to say that arms control is increasingly valued for the information it provides as a function of the various verification provisions it includes. So the question really isn't, is New START sufficient, but rather for how long will it be sufficient and what are its complements? This is where we should focus our energies, our critical thinking, which brings me to my second point about arms control. The increased security we get from arms control is, de is derived from arms control systems, is derived from multiple components that make them up. So consider the entire security landscape. The arms control systems that manage it, that increase security and lower uncertainty are comprised first of treaties like New START that establish limitations by setting ceilings or requiring reductions in arsenals of course, I'm talking about vertical proliferation here. Second, non-proliferation agreements that aim to prevent or constrain horizontal proliferation or the crossing of nuclear thresholds by formerly non-nuclear states and export control regimes, which prevent the export or external transfer of sensitive items and materials. As such, I wanna to suggest to those who would criticize New START decidedly a limitation or reduction treaty as perhaps insufficiently comprehensive or in the limit so harmful to national security that it should be jettisoned ought to bear all of this in mind. And so what does all of this mean for New START today? Well, as Rose Gottmuller has pointed out, the New START extension is simply phase one of a long and intricate process. In fact, the architects of New START already had designs for a follow-on treaty when the treaty was signed. It was never meant to be an endpoint. I would also urge those who would think of arms control in the binary as either good or bad to instead think of arms control agreements as cumulative. I want to suggest that those tempted to identify the freshly inked New START extension as less than what was proposed during the last administration, also bear in mind that it's not uncommon for arms control negotiation agendas to begin relatively broadly 
and then get whittled down throughout the negotiation process. This is indeed a property inherent to negotiations. And finally, were one tempted to think that the US should have agreed to extend New START, but for a duration less than five years, consider that a longer five-year extension sends the signal that the US is serious about the tough work required by arms control negotiations, particularly in a security environment char characterized by increasing complexity. Indeed, it takes years to get a single agreement, even one derived from a pre-existing agreement. Now, setting aside whether it makes sense for China to join New START, were China to sign onto any arms control agreement at all, it will likely take five years for China to build capacity for monitoring and verification. And we have to keep that in mind, have, have to keep in mind that China has little history with and cultural affinity towards intrusive inspections. So what I believe we're looking at is a gradual successive broadening of arms control systems as a whole that by virtue of necessity cover a broader range of delivery vehicles, including hypersonics, for example, and include more negotiation parties or signatories at a minimum. This broadening need not occur within the scope of a single treaty, but rather is more likely possible through additional complementary agreements. Indeed, analysis reveals that consistent, successful negotiation of agreements increases the likelihood of subsequent agreements being reached. So next, we'll have to think really hard about how to get China to the negotiation table. If Russia deploys its INF treaty busting 9M729 missiles east of the Urals, since it's promised to refrain from deploying it west of them, China may become concerned enough to come to the negotiation table. Meanwhile, and in preparation, we should continue track two dialogues with the Chinese on inspections and assist in building capacity in that area. And finally, we should anticipate that while the evolution of technology is augmenting insecurity in the current environment by providing new or enhanced means of delivery, a concurrent trend is for arms control treaties to employ new technologies to augment and enhance verification capabilities, the very definition of dual use. We need to focus on how new remote radiation detection capabilities, for example, can enhance treaty verification provisions. And with that, I'll end on an, an historical note. Thinking of how long it took for the US and the Soviet Union to reach a shared understanding on concepts foundational to arms control like mutually assured destruction. And how once that happened, a major obstacle was removed and negotiation progressed. We should continually anticipate such obstacles and bear in mind that diplomacy calls for, well, a significant amount of diplomatic dialogue with consistent engagement. However, there is much progress we can make. And with that, over to you, Pavel. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so should I just start? Uh, please do, Pavel, the floor is yours. Yeah, okay, well, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to speak and uh, I would like to thank all the participants for uh, joining us. Uh, I, I think it's a very timely uh, question, what's next? Uh, because in fact, today is the day when the, uh, the new start was uh, expected to expire. And I think uh, we should appreciate the role of chance in, uh, in, in, in politics uh, or in the international security, because uh, we are lucky that the Munich conference in uh, 2011 was held in early February. Uh, this is where they exchanged the ratification notes uh, and not say in mid January, we would have been probably in a very difficult, different situation today. So that's uh, something uh, to, uh, to contemplate. So uh, now we got uh, five more years. Uh, I think uh, that's the good news, uh, but we uh, need to be very careful not to waste uh, these uh, five years. And unfortunately, uh, this, uh, this has happened before. We, you could say that we wasted 10 years uh, of the uh, original New Star duration uh, because no significant progress was done, although there were attempts. Uh, for example, the uh, US proposal in 2013 uh, to go uh, lower. Unfortunately, that wasn't taken at the time. 
So now we have uh, the extension and we have a commitment to establish uh, what was uh, uh, described by the presidents in their first call as a strategic stability dialogue. Uh, this is of course a welcome step, uh, but I think everybody understands that it will be extremely difficult to reach a new comprehensive agreement sort of that would uh, bring in all elements uh, of, uh, uh, which Amy uh, just uh, talked about. Uh, things like missile defense, new types of strategic arms, all these under underwater uh, drones and, and things like that, uh, non-strategic weapons, uh, space, uh, prompt uh, conventional uh, strike, uh, all this, if you try to bring it into uh, uh, one single uh, comprehensive agreement and sort of take all that into account, uh, that will become very, very difficult. And I would think that probably impossible. China will be a factor too, of course, uh, and uh, it's not yet clear how this uh, will play out exactly. But uh, so my uh, take is that uh, we should think of uh, maybe smaller, uh, but uh, positive and realistic steps uh, that are within reach. And uh, the important uh, development here is that those small steps could actually prepare ground for future agreements and uh, get us into a position where uh, we will be uh, more comfortable uh, uh, with trusting each other. So first uh, of these steps would be uh, just uh, lower the uh, limit, uh, lower the number of deployed warheads uh, within the new star. Yes, new start limits you to 1550 uh, deployed warheads, but there is no reason that number should be 1550. I think right now it's 1450 uh, or something on both sides. Uh, both sides could just go lower uh, to say 1000, maybe even lower, uh, keeping all keeping all the verifica ver verification provisions will be in place and the new start is in force. And it's, uh, it would be uh, uh, just a political commitment uh, that would be reversible, that would be well understood. But uh, I think that's, uh, that's a step that can be taken and I think it should be taken. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's something that uh, does not require any ratification or any uh, approval process because that's uh, that will be just the national policies within the star uh, the other step uh, that could be made in that direction uh, is something that uh, was discussed in the last weeks uh, of the uh, trump administration the uh, freeze on the total number of weapons and i think that that's also that's within the reach uh, it's uh, entirely possible uh, for both sides to make a commitment not to increase the total number of deployed weapons or not to increase the total number of weapons in their active arsenals. In short, not to produce new, weapon, new, new nuclear warheads. Uh, of course, uh, and that was the stumbling block, then uh, the verification of uh, this kind of a commitment would be uh, extremely difficult. So I think, uh, but I think that as a first step, it could be uh, just a political commitment uh, with full understanding that this will not be verified. But as a political commitment, that would be a very strong, uh, strong step, especially since it would cover the uh, all, all nuclear weapons, the entire uh, arsenal. And uh, if that commitment is made, other uh, nuclear states could be invited to join uh, China first and foremost, but no reason to exclude uh, Britain and France. And I think uh, for pretty much everyone, uh, I know people uh, worry about China, but uh, everyone else uh, definitely in P5 uh, or P4 if you want, uh, don't have plans to increase their active arsenals uh, in any substantial way. So I think that in a way that would be an easy political commitment to make. Uh, uh, and uh, I think it would be, uh, it would be very useful. Of course, uh, it uh, would be good to uh, do something about non-strategic weapons. And uh, the, uh, that's uh, something that uh, should be discussed. Uh, I do believe that even if you could reach an agreement to uh, limit the number of non-strategic weapons in a verifiable way, 
uh, that would be a very difficult task, um, to, just technically. We just don't really have the technology. Uh, so uh, with non-strategic weapons, I think uh, we could move uh, in slightly uh, different, uh, by a slightly different uh, route. Uh, for example, by uh, withdrawing all uh, uh, non-strategic weapons to uh, central storage uh, sites, and that could be made verifiable. Uh, we've done some work on that at UNIDIR uh, that uh, could be, so this could be done. Another important step uh, that could actually move us uh, forward uh, in a very serious way, I think, uh, is uh, this idea of the uh, moratorium on the deployment of INF range systems uh, in Europe. Uh, Russia made an offer to make it verified, to make, to establish the moratorium uh, and make it verifiable. And Russia uh, put uh, its uh, uh, system uh, known as 9M729 uh, on the table. So that system would be covered, even though you know that there is a, this controversy uh, about uh, the true uh, range of that system. So what is important is uh, that uh, if that idea uh, takes hold, uh, then the uh, Europe will return basically to the same INF uh, treaty regime that existed before uh, the treaty collapse. And uh, what's more important, uh, and I think uh, I, I very much like the, the point that Amy made uh, about the evolution of verification uh, uh, technologies and, and arrangements, uh, this uh, kind of arrangement would require development of new verification uh, uh, measurement uh, techniques, uh, tools, uh, procedures, and that could be a very good, uh, very good uh, way to uh, for the United States and Russia to uh, work together. Uh, the next step would be if uh, the moratorium takes hold in Europe, then uh, it is a natural question: uh, why not make it global? The INF uh, treaty was global. Uh, so uh, it's, it should be possible to discuss the idea of extending it to, uh, to, the, to Asia as well. And again, uh, Amy mentioned uh, the, the, that might be a, a way of bringing China into, into the equation because uh, that's, uh, it, China would be uh, presumably interested in not having INF range systems in, uh, around its borders. So, uh, Finally, uh, again, th this is just a short list uh, of, of things. Uh, uh, there, there is a, another step that could be made uh, is uh, nuclear cruise missiles. Uh, I think in, in particular, nuclear sea launch cruise missiles. Uh, at the very least, I think uh, we uh, could try to go back to the arrangement that existed in Old Start uh, where uh, the United States and Russia exchanged uh, the data on the number of deployed uh, uh, nuclear uh, uh, sea launch cruise missiles. And as I understand, they uh, routinely provided zeros. Uh, uh, and now that arrangement uh, uh, ended. Uh, of course, the United States doesn't have uh, uh, nuclear silicons at the moment. Uh, Russia may have, we don't know. Uh, but uh, I think uh, that's uh, something that uh, we, uh, we should consider. Uh, in, in all start, uh, that was non-verifiable. Uh, there is no reason not to discuss possible verification measures. Uh, the new start verification uh, procedures actually would be totally applicable uh, in this situation. It would be difficult politically, but technically uh, it actually can be done relatively easily. So uh, to uh, conclude, I think, uh, again, we, uh, I, I'm all for a new, uh, a new comprehensive uh, strategic stability treaty that would establish uh, a new, new ground. Uh, but I think it is important to uh, work with what we have. And I, I do believe that uh, there are a number of things that can be done today that are uh, politically and technically possible. And uh, we uh, should uh, explore them uh, in a very serious way. Thank you. Amy, Pavel, uh, thank you very much for those incisive uh, and refreshing comments. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. 
I'll abuse my position as chair to, to ask the first question while the uh, uh, participants are, are getting theirs together. Um, it seems to me that the Biden administration has already got a lot of pieces in play. There's a lot of moving parts here. Um, and I'm minded that it took um, eight years to get the INF Treaty tucked away. I mean, it started in 79 under Carter. Um, in terms of the dual track approach. What, I mean, what are the nice to have and what are the need to have priorities here? You've got 60 months, what should the prioritization look like? Uh, and is there a risk that, you know, because there are so many moving parts, um, the focus is dissipated? I, it, simply in kind of personnel terms, you kind of reconstituting the capability within the US State Department seems like a kind of significant task in itself. Pavel, by all means, stop. Okay, uh, yes, uh, I could try. Well, uh, everything is priority. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, the uh, uh, one thing that uh, could be done and should be done. And, and uh, I think it's uh, to make sure that the, uh, the new start kind of a framework is, uh, is viable. And again, I think this is uh, uh, the point that Amy uh, made in her remarks that uh, new start was designed to be kind of extendable in many ways. And, and I actually, I do believe that it, uh, it is uh, perfectly extendable. You could just change the number from 1550 and the number of launchers to lower and lower number uh, because the treaty provides uh, a very good, uh, very good framework for verification, for data exchange, and uh, it provides you, uh, it can even be extended to non-strategic weapons. Uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, we, uh, with some caveats, we already have zero deployed non-strategic weapons and we could we could work uh, to make sure that it is brought into the uh, new start framework uh, having said that uh, there is a there are two kind of nagging issues uh, that are a bit uh, related uh, which is the new types of strategic arms uh, all these exotic uh, uh, technologies that uh, we uh, were unveiled in Russia in uh, March uh, 2018 uh, and missile defense. And they, they are to some extent related because Russia says that its systems, they are response to the uh, US missile defense deployment. So uh, with uh, uh, the, so new start will not survive if those issues are not resolved in some way. So with missile defense, I think it's uh, it's relatively simple because uh, we could uh, just the, repeat that formula that was found in New Star that the uh, offensive and defensive uh, arms are uh, uh, was the word uh, there is an interrelationship between them, uh, but at the current level, uh, they do not undermine offensive forces. So that's, uh, and that's formula that I believe would, would be true for many years, uh, if not forever. Uh, so with the new, with the exotic systems, it's a bit more tricky, uh, but I do believe that it should be possible to either induce kind of a, provide enough incentives to Russia to uh, freeze their deployment or, or maybe bring them into the new start uh, numbers. I mean, these are not great numbers, so it's not, would, be, would not be a, a, a limit. So that's, these are the challenges. And I think we should uh, maybe, uh, if we could clear those two, uh, then uh, I think the, the road will be open to just extending new start with the lower numbers as a new, uh, as a new uh, treaty. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Amy? Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, going back to the question of the new administration, um, it's obviously this is, this is all happening rather fast for a new team, right? So they've, the inauguration was the end of January. The new team is still taking shape. 
Um, not all the political appointments have been made. That said, this is a very seasoned team who likely um, have been thinking about these issues and uh, speaking to them for the campaign for quite some time. So I don't doubt that there's a plan in place. There are just some pieces still missing. Um, and I'm optimistic. There's a tremendous amount of interagency coordination that has to go on, particularly between the, the State Department and the Department of Defense to even get a proposal on the table. Um, and I'm optimistic that in the new administration, this will be a smoother process. Um, to Pavel's point about Russian, Russian exot exotics are, are a high priority and a relatively easy get. Some, some of these systems already fall under new start limita limitations. And it's really just a matter of, of acknowledging that and, and, and including that under the existing treaty. Um, the architects of the new start treaty were turning to non-strategic weapons next. So I think that's a really high priority um, in terms of what comes next. And then as Pavel mentioned, let's keep going. Let's keep reducing our numbers. This is our legal obligation under the non-proliferation treaty. So, so it's a, a sort of obvious next step. Thanks, Amy. Uh, I'm going to take a written question here from, uh, and I excuse the pronunciation of my thick Scottish accent, uh, Hiroki Nakanishi. Uh, and basically, I, I'll roll a couple of questions together. Uh, as you might expect, um, uh, it's about China, and I, and I imagine China will, will come up probably quite a lot in our, in our discussions and questions over the next half hour or so. Um, basically, how can we incentivize China? Uh, in terms of joining a trilateral, regional, or global nuclear arms control, um, and if China isn't ready to go for formal frameworks, um, you know how can the U.S. and Russia and China agree to develop um, or, or limit the use in, of their dual-use capable systems? Um, I, and a kind of follow-on question is: um, How can we? Uh, and by that, I would imagine the US, uh, Russia, uh, and perhaps the rest, if they're involved, uh, encourage China to open their capabilities in terms of tra transparency, uh, specifically ensuring uh, initial uh, reporting uh, and declaration for verification and mon monitoring purposes. So, uh, you know, how the question really is how to engage China, um, what's the art of the possible? Who would like to start? I can start. Amy, thanks. Um, I'm bringing China into a, well, thank you for the question. It's a great, it's a great set of questions and a really rich uh, area for thought. Um, in terms of bringing China into New Start, it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense given where China's numbers are at and where the United States and Russia are at. Um, uh, so I, I think that's going to be a heavier lift than actually engaging China diplomatically in, in, in other ways, um, continuing, as I'd mentioned, the track two dialogues on verification, um, I think, are a fruitful endeavor. Uh, maintaining dialogue and diplomacy overall, I think, are going to help to this end. Um, and you bring up a really interesting point about regional agreements. Um, and in many ways, that's a great starting place. Um, you know, we've discussed through the missile dialogues, um, you know, the proliferation of cruise missiles in the Asia Pacific. Um, and so uh, for lack of a better word, a process of socializing China into an arms control culture, a series of agreements, a series of easier lifts uh, might be a great place to start. Thanks. Pavel? Yeah, let me uh, try. Uh, this is a, this is a very important uh, question. And I, and I think that uh, I, I, I would agree with what uh, Amy said. And uh, I, I think that it's uh, the, the difficult part here is to find uh, what, what it is that the United States and others could offer uh, China for, to, to bring it into the, uh, into the discussion. And there is not uh, that much, in fact. So a uh, couple of things, and uh, I think, uh, again, uh, one idea uh, was mentioned uh, here earlier, uh, this, uh, uh, the idea of no, uh, the, 
Asian moratorium or global moratorium on uh, nuclear uh, on uh, INF uh, INF systems, the INF range systems. Uh, again, it's a it's a bit of a tricky uh, thing to navigate, but you could imagine that if, uh, for example, the United States and Russia would agree not to uh, in not to increase the number of any conventional or nuclear, because they technically don't don't have any uh, at the moment, uh, uh, INF range uh, systems uh, in in the region, uh, then. Uh, it would be reasonable to ask China to join and not to increase uh, its number of uh, INF range systems. It is higher today than in uh, whether in the US and Russia, but it's uh, uh, something uh, something that China might be interested in. I, I think a, a, an additional uh, a kind of a sweetener there would be that idea of no nuclear uh, sea launch cruise missiles. Uh, because I think uh, the uh, that, that's where the uh, China would probably worry uh, with the plans, uh, the U.S. plans to uh, build new uh, nuclear silicon. Uh, so, if, if agreement along these lines could be uh, could be something that uh, China might be interested in. Again, uh, I would think that it could start again as a political commitment or the soft commitment of the uh, type uh, that was in uh, in the old old start uh, uh, with the just reporting uh, and moving kind of slowly toward verifiable arrangement. Another important point, this is where I think China could be brought in uh, and it's, uh, it's not easy, but nothing of that is easy, uh, is uh, the uh, real attention to the fissile material cutoff treaty, so ending the production of fissile material uh, for weapons. Uh, this is, uh, this can be done as a, I mean, China is normally uh, more fa in favor of multinational, international, multi international agreements rather than bilateral. And this is a, uh, this is, this would be a good way to limit uh, China's uh, military capability. Uh, it is well known that uh, the current stock of fissile materials is not particularly large. And uh, if, uh, if one freezes that on the current level, uh, then uh, the, uh, China's ability to increase the number of its nuclear weapons uh, would be limited as well. And I think, again, it's, it's not an easy, uh, an easy, uh, uh, easy task, but uh, I, I think that much more attention should be paid to, to that issue. Uh, and there, there is room for uh, progress there. Thanks for that. Um, I see Klaus Wittmann has his hand up. If we go to Klaus. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine, Klaus. Thank you. Yes, uh, I am Klaus Wittmann, former Bundeswehr general, and I have to say, as a young lieutenant colonel, I uh, spent a happy year at the IISS writing an Adelphi paper on conventional arms control. Now, uh, I heard several uh, times that uh, the so-called non-strategic weapons were uh, mentioned even with the proposal to store them in centralized stor storage silos. Uh, that interests me, of course, as a German because as you may be aware, the question of the US free fall bombs in Western Germany comes up every now and then. And now even the governing Social Democratic Party is about to make the quest for their unilateral withdrawal and election campaign topic, endangering in my mind, the nuclear sharing of Germany and NATO. So my question, do you see any Russian readiness to make uh, their many hundreds uh, uh, non-strategic uh, um, weapons object of a deal? Or will they just wait for governments like uh, Germany to become sufficiently pacifist to end the stationing in their country unilaterally? Pavel, yeah, I think that's one for you. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's my... Uh... So thank you. This is a good question. And uh... We actually, uh, uh, as I mentioned, we, we've done some work uh, on, on that specific topic uh, at, at UNIDIR, 
uh, you could, uh, if you go to the website unidero.org and uh, look uh, look up my name or look up the report, it, it's called Lock Them Up, uh, Zero Deployed uh, new, uh, Non-Strategic Weapons in, in Europe. Uh, the, uh, we, what we uh, arrived uh, uh, to was that basically it would be uh, extremely difficult to uh, Open up the uh, the the, the uh, nuclear weapons, non-strategic weapons for counting, uh, and uh, that's that's something that may be done some way in the future, but it's uh, it's uh, very difficult. What we could do instead, uh, we could uh, move them away from the deployment uh, de deployment sites uh, from the from the operational bases, and if you. Uh, uh, look at that, and then you verify the absence of weapons uh, in uh, in uh, in Kaliningrad, for example. There is a so you could, and the verification would be uh, fairly simple. You just kind of walk into a storage side, and you see that it is empty. So you don't need to uh, count warheads. You don't need to uh, disclose uh, any information about them. So that would be uh, sort of, and that you kind of push these weapons farther and farther from uh, from the deployment, and that's uh, uh, and there are also steps uh, that would allow you to verify that not only there are no weapons at the moment, uh, but in fact there are uh, there is uh, this facility, for example, cannot uh, store weapons uh, for any extended period of time. So that's uh, that's something that uh, can be done. And again, that, that could be extended to uh, to uh, other systems, for example, the uh, sea launch cruise missiles and, and other naval uh, naval systems. So, so that that, in my view, uh, that is not a perfect solution. Uh, but I think uh, this is exactly the uh, the the case where the perfect is the enemy of the good. And I think uh, the just moving uh, uh, non-strategic weapons away from deployment, moving them to central storage uh, is uh, a very good uh, step uh, toward uh, controlling uh, deployment of these weapons. Thanks, Pavel. Amy, anything you'd like to add? Sure. Um, Pavel, it's stunningly simple, isn't it? Just move the weapons, right? <laughs> For all, all our talk of the increasing complexity of verification regimes and increasing, increasing, uh, increasing increasingly intrusive nature of them, um, it is, as I understand it, a matter of um, the verification technology and the relative degree of intrusiveness. It's why we can't have on-site inspections. Um, Pavel, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and that technology is is not an impossibility. So if we go the, the more technical route, um, uh, it, it does remain a possibility. Pavel? Yeah, just to add, uh, no, I, uh, I, I agree, uh, Amy, that this is, uh, this is where uh, I, I think we should kind of think about uh, making the best out of the technology that we have. Uh, and uh, this is why this idea of kind of verifying the absence of weapons, uh, this is, I, I think this is, this is totally plausible, totally feasible. In fact, we are right now, we, uh, we, are, uh, uh, we are running a project at Unidir that would uh, put together a scenario of this kind of inspection. So you arrive at the base to make sure that there are no weapons there. And it's not entirely easy because you need to agree what the weapon is and how do you, how do you verify that there are no weapons. Uh, but, but that's, I think we would agree that uh, it's easier than uh, making counting actual weapons with all this complexity of information bearers and all that. So yeah, that's uh, something we should think. Thanks for those answers. Uh, a couple of written questions on uh, EBM. Uh, one uh, from Manfred Seti, uh, who says, uh, I'm wondering whether either uh, of the presenters think an ABM treaty of sorts between the US, Russia, and China is a possibility. Who'd like to start? Uh, sorry, ABM? Yeah. 
an uh, APM treaty. <laughs> uh, well, uh, it seems I already have a floor, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, I think it's not really in the cards. Uh, and uh, I mean, there are many reasons for that. Uh, and uh, one is uh, that, and I usually make this uh, point to uh, my uh, Russian colleagues who advocate the kind of a certain limits on uh, missile defense and all that. I mean, look at what happened. Uh, the, uh, why the, the United States withdrew from the old ABM treaty so uh, why the new ABM treaty would be any different in that regard? So I, I think it's uh, uh, the uh, missile defense uh, is an issue to, to, to work around, to deal with, uh, but I don't think that it's just setting the numerical limits uh, would, uh, is the, the right way to do that. Amy, any thoughts? Yeah. I think it's a heavy lift further exacerbated by the fact that there's so much asymmetry in what these systems constitute and what they're protecting. It makes it really difficult to get an agreement that applies equally to all the, the signatories. Okay, I think uh, Timothy Wright has his uh, blue hand up. Thank you very much. Um, President Biden has promised that the US will push back against Russian actions that uh, Washington considers harmful. Uh, and Secretary of State Blinken reiterated this and discussed some of these issues uh, during his phone call to Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov yesterday. But does the panel think that arms control can be sufficiently insulated from other damaging bilateral political developments, given the, given the poor state of uh, US-Russia relations? Thank you. Yeah, I'll jump in. I would say yes, absolutely, unequivocally. The United States and Russia have always been able to talk about arms control, even when relations were at an all-time low. Um, that despite the fact that, that indeed the United States is back in terms of its presence on the world stage and will continue to uh, publicly engage uh, on behalf of democracy the world over. Pavel? Yeah, uh, I, 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 I agree. And uh, ironically, uh, I think uh, that in a way, these kind of tensions uh, between uh, the United States and Russia and the, the, those many issues, uh, in a way, they would uh, provide additional incentive to be serious about arms control, nuclear arms control in, in, in particular. So, uh, and, and in a way, uh, these, are, uh, these are issues that are Come in, uh, they, they are in the different departments in um, both states. And the, this is something that uh, Russia and the United States know how to do, there is experience. And uh, so I, I do believe that there is, uh, uh, the, the way I see that uh, there, there is a kind of political will to separate those and to move the, uh, with arms control, uh, uh, in, in parallel with kind of dealing with all other issues, no matter how serious these agreements might be there. Thanks, Pavel. This question here from uh, Al McKenna. Uh, he said, uh, and it's directed to you, Pavel, uh, you mentioned new tools and techniques for verification and potentially spaces for new collaborative efforts here. Can you provide any further details? New, new tools? For, for verification. For Verification. Yes. I, well, uh, I, as, I, as, I, as I mentioned, we are, we are working on this uh, concept of uh, verifying the absence and the, not just the concept. We, we've done the report uh, on, on the conceptual. Right now, we are working on kind of a practical implementation of, of that. So, so how do you uh, make sure, how do you certify that certain, uh, certain military base does not have nuclear weapons there? or cannot have nuclear weapons deployed there. And yeah, we'll see, there are, uh, yeah, there, there are some uh, new, new, uh, new technologies that, there, that, that could be applied. And uh, so we're, we're working on that. And, and there, there, quite a bit of work has been done in, in that area uh, by various groups. Uh, people largely looked at sort of how you dismantle weapon, how do you, uh, make sure that the weapon is a weapon. Uh, I think we are moving in a slightly different direction. We just 
want to make sure that there are no weapons. Uh, it's, uh, it, it requires different approaches, but that's, uh, that's uh, we, we definitely can build on uh, a very good work that's been done uh, so far. Amy? Yeah, thanks, great question. Um, so to the, the, the question of the technological development, right, of, of these, uh, capabilities, these verification capabilities. Um, this in the United States is largely the work of the national labs and the national labs system, um, Sandia, Lawrence Livermore National Labs. Um, and uh, there have been some really interesting conversations around the co-development of verification technologies. So creating partnerships, scientist to scientist, lab to lab partnerships between the United States and Russia, between the United States and China. And I think this is a really rich and interesting area of conversation. Um, uh, and it kind of points to the, the unique rules associated with technology adoption for verification and arms control treaties, which can be a really controversial um, uh, issue when you think of the long debates in the Open Skies Treaty on um, lenses and sensors. Um, this is a, a whole rich area for, for further conversation, but also further research and, and investigation. So it's a great question. Thanks. Thanks, Amy. And uh, there's a, a blue hand raised by Michael Mostig. Uh, good morning. I wanted to know if you would take the your comments to Mr. Wright's question about uh, with with the Soviet with Russia. You know, the United States has a long history of being able. The two countries have a long history of being able to walk and chew gum at the same time on arms control. What about China, where we have almost no history in that regard? And if anything, the political and diplomatic issues uh, with China are more front and center and visceral. Please go ahead, Amy. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, I don't know that I agree with the last part of that statement that the that the issues are more front and center and visceral when you consider the context of the Cold War. Um, and um, the great divide between uh, communism and capitalism that was pretty prominent. Um, but um, I will say that uh, your question's right on the mark because this is exactly the sort of interaction that the US and China and, and maybe even Russia and China should be uh, aiming for at this time, bearing in mind that this is not gonna be easy. And if you look to the US-Russian model, this, this in fact took decades, um, not only of just being able to come to the table, but being able to come to the table with the same kinds of proposals or with um, negotiators who were imp actually empowered to negotiate. And then we moved on to shared beliefs and cornerstone concepts, which took a long time to hammer out. Um, you know, and, and in the end of all that, when, when, when all of these obstacles had been overcome in the case of um, SALT-1, um, the treaty relied on national technical means. So it took a great deal of time and uh, significant investment in further dialogue to, to get to sort of the next phase of verification technology and, and, and even on-site inspections. On-site inspections are, are, are a big ask, a, a, a big risk, and are, are, are rightfully viewed as incredibly intrusive. So um, my answer, I suppose, to the question is that we can't, we can't start that sort of dialogue socialization process soon enough. Thank you. Pavel, anything to add? Yeah, just very briefly, I think uh, I would probably contradict myself. I said earlier that uh, the uh, in the U.S.-Russia context, uh, the uh, we could separate these uh, issues of, of the arms control from the kind of attention and these agreements. Uh, on the other hand, if you look back at the history of U.S. Uh, Soviet and U.S.-Russian arms control. Uh, all the almost all the agreements uh, were reached uh, successful agreements were reached at the time of uh, some kind of rapprochement, detente, or reset, or perestroika, and things like that. So, it's uh, I think uh, the if we go to China, 
uh, I think uh, just it should be understood that in my view, there, there has to be kind of a, a, a general dialogue uh, sort of there is, a, you cannot start these kind of a, uh, arms control discussions in the, in the situation when you are uh, in kind of loggerheads on uh, all kinds of issues. There, there has to be some kind of a movement uh, uh, to political, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't say kind of reconciliation, but at least uh, political dialogue. And uh, well, we'll see how it will work. It's, it's, it, but it's a difficult, yeah, it's a difficult job. Thanks. There's a question here from Carla Pabellino, which uh, fascinates me. It's, it, it's um, addressed to you, Dr. Nelson, but I think I, I'd be intrigued uh, 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 on your answers from, from both of you. Uh, and Carla asks, I'd like to ask what an alternative to strategic stability in arms control could be, if any, it, it, it is possible in the context of a multipolar world. So a, a fairly open-ended question, shall we say. It, it's huge. And um, Carla, we could have a very long conversation on this topic. Um, and there are a series of conversations happening right now on the, the robustness of st strategic stability, which in large measure relies on a a bright dividing line between conventional and nuclear weapons. Um, and the question, one of the most prominent questions for me at least is how long can we maintain this illusion of division between conventional and nuclear um, when innovation is happening at such a rapid pace and conflict is, is full spectrum, uh, you know, gray zone, gray zone and beyond. Um, and so we get to the question of um, how stability inducing <laughs> are these are these concepts? Is this distinction uh, what would throw strategic stability off its calibrated balance? Um, was it a myth all along? And um, a, a personal favorite for me is is this um, is is this stabilizing, this idea that we can have stable deterrence in the nuclear realm? Is it stabilizing simply because we all believe it to be true, uh, whether it is or not? And is there added value in the fact that it has a kind of anchoring effect in decision theoretic language? Um, we've we've held, it, held onto it as a truth for so long that we maybe have kind of actualized it into having stabilizing properties all of which might be more theoretical and philosophical than you uh, intended when you asked your question, but I'm happy to continue the conversation. Pavel? Yeah, that's a, that, that, that's a very, very, very good point. I would say that my take is that uh, there is no such thing as strategic stability in, in the sense that it is what we say it is. And- You said and, it, not me. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's a, it's a, it's a point where we, if we, do, if we believe that things are stable, then they are, and the, and we can come up with different measures. Just an example, I guess, uh, if, uh, if you go back a uh, hundred plus years ago, uh, the uh, strategic stability was measured, I, I don't know, in the number and the tonnage of battleships uh, in, the, in the UK and in Germany. And today, uh, I guess the strategic stability is uh, about fishing rights. So that's that tells you something that uh, it is uh, we we should probably, at least in my view, uh, try to build conditions that would kind of a change the meaning of strategic stability and move it away from kind of a beam counting of uh, the number of weapons. Uh, to different uh, ways. I mean, who has uh, better lawyers uh, in uh, WTO disputes or things like that? That would be, and then the weapons would be largely irrelevant in my view. I'm conscious of the time. I'm gonna take one last reading question, which uh, is from an anonymous attendee uh, and asks, Considering that the US is under development, uh, boost hypersonic glide vehicles will be conventionally armed uh, and uh, MRBM-IRBM range system, whereas Russia's avant-garde 
is, a nuclear, is nuclear armed and has an ICBM range, will different national doctrines present challenges for limiting the number of these systems? So it's really, um, are hypersonic glide vehicles and potentially hypersonic cruise missiles going to be particularly problematic because of the different applications that the, the countries now developing them, you know, Russia, the US and, and China, uh, foresee for these systems? Uh, who'd like to start? Okay, Pavel, you go. Let me uh, try uh, briefly. In my world, uh, the uh, all of these hypersonic gliders will be covered one way or another. If it's uh, if it's the Russian intercontinental uh, glider, it will be counted uh, in uh, in New. Star. It is already counted in New Start. And uh, although we, strictly speaking, we don't know if it's nuclear, we, we don't know if it's not. Uh, and the kind of medium range uh, systems would be covered under the, uh, the moratorium or a ban on INF uh, systems. Again, uh, this is, uh, you could definitely uh, argue that this is a, a technology that offers certain military capabilities and all that. Uh, but at the same time, it, it is clear uh, and uh, that it's uh, it's a system in search of a mission. So there is a yes, you could come up with some kind of interesting applications, but uh, I'm sure that again, if you you don't need to deploy it, it's it's just a product of certain uh, certain developments uh, that are not necessarily kind of driven by military military demand. So that would be my take, I guess. Amy. Well, I think Pavel put it beautifully, and I, I, I do think they either are or will all be subject to constraint, and I think they should. And I think it sort of highlights the dark underbelly of the innovation that drives these new technologies, where just because you can have the technology, to Pavel's point about um, a system in search of a mission, should you? And I, I think it's a it's good fodder for asking ourselves whether whether and how uh, we approach uh, innovation for innovation's sake, um, which of course in the limit is the, the arms racing we all want to avoid. Thank you. Okay, I'm conscious it is now three o'clock. Uh, Pavel, Amy, any final thoughts you want to, you want to pose? Well, let me just, uh, yeah, I think, it, well, it is, uh, is uh, I just want to maybe uh, make the, the, the same point again. I, I think we are, uh, we are the difficult position. We, there are many factors and, and uh, but I, I do believe that there are steps that uh, can be taken, uh, that sh should be taken and uh, we should build on uh, what we already have, and and I think uh, there is a, a quite a bit that can be done uh, from uh, where we are uh, today. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, I would agree. It's an increasingly complex time, but I feel more uh, optimistic than I have in a long time. There's actually a lot of good work we can do, and in short order. Thank you. Well, as chair, uh, first of all, I have a, an apology to make in that we still have an awful lot of questions we're just not going to get to answer. Um, but a uh, comment to all of them was uh, basically to pass on your thanks uh, to the two presenters who've been uh, fantastic. So, Pavel, Amy, thanks very much for your time again uh, for a rich and, uh, and stimulating conversation. Uh, uh, and uh, the exam question for the next one is, you know, is strategic stability a myth? discuss. Uh, thanks everybody for uh, listening in. Thank you.